Hey guys, welcome to our video today. My name is Dr. Tom LeHue and we're going to be talking about the defense mechanism or the defense strategy of Enneagram Type 2s. So if you are a 2 or you have a 2 in your life, I hope this video is helpful to you. I hope it is encouraging and challenging to you. And if you enjoy this kind of information, please go to my website, TomLahue.com. Go to the store on the top of the menu and download my free uh, ebook. It's just a 27-page study called The Hidden Battle. And it's all about each Enneagram type's defense mechanism or defense strategy. You know, each of the types has a defense strategy. And also on my website, I do offer Enneagram coaching. You say, what is that? Well... Let's face it, life is hard and sometimes, you know, there's not somebody to talk to and the Enneagram is such a great tool to help us know more about ourselves and uh, to see our blind spots, to see what real growth might look like for us. And sometimes in relationships, you know, you can feel like you're loving and you're loving and you're loving, but it's just not being reciprocated. Like there's, there's some conflict or maybe arguing or just silence and it can be very painful to be in a relationship like this. And you know, what a great tool to help us have better relationships. And I'm a seven, I want you to be happy. I want you to, to experience life to the fullest. And if I can help you, please reach out to me. Just go to my website, tomlehue.com. All right, let's jump into this information today and let's talk about type twos. Now, if you are a two, I'm so glad that you found this channel. I'm so glad that you're able to, um, you know, take some time and, and challenge yourself like this. And realize what I say as I go over this list is, is probably some of it going to feel very good. You're like, yes, okay, I needed to hear that. But then there's other things that might be difficult or challenging, and that's just the nature of this kind of work. And, uh, you know, let's start with what is the defense mechanism of Enneagram Type 2, the giver, the helper, you know, the befriender, the connector. What is the, uh, what is the uh, defense strategy? Well, it's called repression. Uh, repression and repression has the idea of not necessarily taking the time to be able to analyze yourself and your own needs and your own challenges because you're so busy focused on others. Now that seems like a good thing, right? You know, it seems like why isn't everybody more like this? If you're a two and you're hearing that, you're thinking, okay, why is that a bad thing? You know, I mean, shouldn't we all be focused on taking care of other people? Shouldn't we all be focused on ministering to people and loving people and, you know, giving aid and comfort to people? And I can't fault you there. Um, think of it like this. You have a great lesson to teach the rest of us. The rest of us who are not twos, you know, everybody else on the dial, you know, you have a great challenge for all of us to put others' needs ahead of our own sometimes. The problem is, is for you, you might do this unconsciously to the point that you overextend yourself and repress your own needs, your own desires, uh, your own um, need for support or encouragement or appreciation to the point that like resentment starts to build up and it can damage your relationships. So let's start with, uh, you know, some of the notes here. I've got a couple of pages in this handout. Like I said, you can go to the website and get that for free. But type twos referred to as the helpers, the givers, they're characterized by their desire to be loved and feel needed and to help others. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's fine. Um, doesn't everybody want to be loved and cared for and needed? I mean, yeah, we all do. It just may not be the principal driver behind our motivations in life. Often putting others' needs ahead of their own. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very noble thing to do. It's a very good thing to do. It's just, you know, there may come a point where you are suffering because of this and your relationships are going to suffer because of this tendency to put others needs ahead of their own a core desire to feel loved and appreciated notice what you give away is the very thing you want we all do this with the enneagram the very thing that we're chasing is what we in our health give away to others and so this desire to be loved and appreciated notice that's what you give to others when you're at your best you give love and appreciation and kindness and warmth and think of it like this, it's all the things that you, you really want for yourself too. You're, you're in a sense, you're training other people. This is how we should all behave and this is the way you should treat me as well. 
But what happens when that isn't reciprocated? What happens when you don't get the love and attention and appreciation and kindness and warmth and affection and all the things that that you really need? What happens when you don't receive those things? Well, you're going to feel pretty bad. I mean, you're, you might feel very hurt. You might feel misunderstood. You might feel like, you know, you're not really loved or cared for. And, you know, it may be, uh, there may be times in your life where you kind of reached a precipice and you said, you know, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with this person. I keep chasing after them. I keep caring for them. I keep helping them. And, you know, they just are such a tough nut to crack. I just am exhausting myself with this person. I need to move away from, from this relationship or move away from this person. Twos have a core desire to feel loved and appreciated and their core fear. Now, this is not easy, okay? This is hard work to face these things. Remember, your, your defense strategy is repression, which means as we go through this kind of information, you're tempted to say, no, 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 I don't think that's, I don't think that's me. No, 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 I don't think that's, that's repression, okay? I don't think I'm like that. I don't think I have this need. So you have to, you know, pride, remember the sin of the two is pride. Pride is a very hard sin to deal with because it tends to move away from you when you try to focus on it. When you try to see it, and you try to say, well, how, how am I impacted by pride? And a lot of twos, you know, they have a hard time with this. When you when you first sit down with a, an Enneagram type two and you go through the types and they realize they're a two and you say to them, your sin is pride, you know, they often have a real struggle with this. Like, how, how am I the one in the room that has pride? I mean, my husband or my, you know, my wife or my kids, they're so dominant. You know, they just control everything. I... How am I the one with pride? And it can be a very hard sin to, to be able to see in yourself. And it says the core fear of the two is being unworthy of love or being unlovable, or you could say unwanted or uncared for. Now realize there's times when this is very destructive to your relationships. Um, you, may, you may genuinely feel like your spouse or your kids or your parents or whatever aren't really caring for you to the degree that you would like, that they're not really loving you. But what's funny is if I were to sit down with that spouse and I would say, do you love your wife? Do you love your husband? They would say, absolutely, 100%, of course I love my wife. But there's something in you that may have a hard time believing that statement. You know, they're looking right at me, telling me they love me, but everything that I'm witnessing or everything I'm experiencing or my feelings tend to, tend to challenge that and make it hard for me to believe that. because. Because if they really loved me, or if they really cared about me, then surely they would, and then what? Maybe be more focused on meeting your needs or knowing your needs? I mean, think of it like this, twos, and we, we will get into this information. I just, I get sidetracked, and okay, so think of it like this. You are a two, so you have this giant radar system that sort of sees what people need, and then you feel obligated to meet those needs. Okay, realize that everybody else is not a two. Everybody else that's not a two, your husband, your kids, your parents, your brothers, sisters, all these people that you're in relationships with, they are not twos. They don't necessarily have that same radar system. So even if they were to pick up on a need that you have, and remember, you make it very difficult sometimes because it's not easy for you to share your needs directly. It's hard for twos often. They say they struggle with saying out loud, this is what I need. So the assumption is, if you really cared about me, or if you really loved me, you would know what I need without me having to say it out loud, without me having to be direct about it. And obviously you don't know what I need. You don't really understand what I want out of this. And so that just gives evidence to this fear that I'm not really loved or cared for. And realize your spouse, your kids, your parents, everybody else, they're gonna be stretching their head saying, what did I do that made you feel this way? And just, I want you to see this one truth. The fear lives in you. And then you sort of see how other people are provoking that fear or causing that fear to rise to the surface. And your, your tendency might be to blame them that they're causing you to feel this way. They're not going to understand what they've done because they might think, I interact with all these other people and they don't respond to me with this, you know, accusation that I'm not caring for them or loving them. Okay, that's such great information, so challenging. And, you know, don't, if you agree with some of this, 
let you may not agree with all of this, okay? So you probably won't. There's probably not a video I've made that everybody agrees with everything, right? So if you're if you're hearing this and you're being encouraged or challenged or provoked a little bit, just stay with it and and don't Okay, let me just move on. All right, so the defense mechanism is repression. Repression for type twos involves pushing away their own needs, their own desires, and their own feelings to focus on those of others. Um, now, you know, again, is there anything wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just this could end up put, painting you in a corner that's not comfortable for you or the people around you. So telling yourself no, or telling yourself your needs are not important, or that it's selfish for you to spend time, money, energy, space, you know, on your own needs and caring for yourself, this could paint you into a corner and, you know, feelings of resentment could start to grow. Feelings of obligation from the other people that you're caring for, like, okay, you've done all this for me, now I guess I have to, um, you know, respond in a certain way or you're going to get your feelings hurt. And I don't want that. I don't want to cause you pain. So the, the mechanism helps twos maintain a self-image of being altruistic and indispensable. No, I'm here for others. I'm here for you. I don't need anything. I'm fine. Uh, I don't need any help. And if I do allow you to help me, it's because I, I'm caring about you and giving you a job that, so that you can feel special. But I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Notice the self-image that you want to have of yourself is of being strong, competent, powerful, and not in need of help from other people. No, you're here to help others. You're here to take care of them. And so to that, in that sense, it's, it may be hard for you to, to be seen by others as, as an equal or as a peer. People will probably see you as their servant. Two wing one is literally called the servant. Uh, two wing three is called the hostess. People might see you like sort of in a one down position, like you're here to take care of us, you know, like you're the maid or you're the servant. Or people might look at you as though you're above us, like you're the nurse, the doctor, and we're all the sick children that you're taking care of. But notice like it's maybe hard for people to see you like on an even field with them. Or you may have a hard time seeing others, you know, on that in that even way. And that's going to affect the relationship. That's going to definitely affect the relationship. Avoiding acknowledging your own vulnerabilities and needs. And, you know, there's been times when I've been working with people and I'll think this person might be a one, they might be a two, I'm not sure. And so I'm explaining it to them and I'll see them shut down. I'll see them clam up. I'll see them not want to talk anymore, you know, as they're learning about the Enneagram, feeling very vulnerable and feeling, and I realize they're not an eight. Why are they feeling so vulnerable? Oh, okay. They're not a one, they're a two. Like this is pressing in beneath that, that surface. It's pressing in and it's starting to feel very uncomfortable. And remember, you integrate to four. At your best, you, you, start to, you start to ask yourself these questions about who am I and what do I care about? And it's okay for me to take care of my own needs. And okay, all right. Um, okay, let's look at the next page. How repression shows up for type twos. Well, there's like one, two, three, four, five ways. Number one, ignoring your own personal needs. So ignore, ignoring your own personal needs. Um, it may feel like, you know, there's no time for you to need things. Uh, twos may repress their own needs or feelings, prioritizing helping others, believing that their own worth is tied to their usefulness to others. Like, there's no time for me to be sick. There's no time for me to be sick. I got to take care of the kids. I got to take care of this. I got to, I got to help with that. There's no time for me, you know, to take, to read a book. Like if I were to sit down and read a book, my kids would come to me like, mom, what's wrong? Or dad, what's wrong with you? Um, you know, what are you doing? Taking time for yourself. Um, but you know, you've got to replenish the batteries. You've got to recharge. You've got to have some withdrawn space or maybe some assertive space where you just take care of your own needs or take care of yourself so that you can maintain and, and stay up and stay positive and stay happy and light and joyful and all these things that, 
you know, make us all want to be around each other. Difficulty with receiving. Now, isn't that interesting? You are the giver, but you have sometimes a hard time receiving from others. Let's read this. They might find it challenging to accept help or kindness from other people, repressing their needs to maintain an image of being the caregiver, not the one who needs care. Um, that's so interesting, isn't it? Like you have a hard time receiving. Think about it like this. There's a joy that you get in helping another person, in caring for another person, in bringing aid or comfort to another person. And without realizing it, you might be uh, limiting another person from being able to experience that with you. You might be prohibiting other people from experiencing same, that same joy by giving care and aid and help to you. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. Difficulty with receiving. Um, kindness from others and care from others to maintain that image of I'm the one who's taking care of. I'm the one who's, you know, kissing the baby in the photo. I'm the one that's that's there to give help to them. But how does it feel to you to be the person that is in need? You know, to be the person that everybody is rallying around and, you know, giving their cards and their money and their support and bringing you meals and taking care of you. How does that feel? It might it might be difficult for you to accept that. Although what's funny is like, I think in your core, in your heart, you really do want that. Like you want to receive that. You want people to, to, to signify their love and their care for you in these ways. But notice there may be something within you that tends to resist it when they actually try to give that to you. So interesting, right? Okay, next is overextension. Twos tend to overextend themselves in their desire to be needed, uh, repressing feelings of exhaustion. Like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. I just gotta keep going just a little bit longer. I keep my head down and get this done, take care of this, the kids need this, dad needs this, whatever, okay. So feelings of exhaustion, and then here's the big one, I hate to say it, but feelings of resentment or unfulfilled personal desires in the process, resentment. Okay, let's, so let's just go ahead and say it. Resentment is the killer to relationships, it just is. Resentment is what destroys marriages. Resentment is like a buildup of frustration, a buildup of anger, a buildup of like these bad feelings because I don't feel like this other person really is caring about me. I don't feel like they're really focused on meeting my needs. And what builds up over time is like this infection. It's like this cancer or this cyst, you know, that just fills up with all this poison. What is the poison? It's resentment. And notice how this in this way, you might actually be contributing to the destruction of your relationship. Contributing in sort of a roundabout way. You're caring, you're giving, you're helping, but then it's hard for you maybe to speak up and say what you need out loud, or you do say it and they ignore it, and then what do you feel? You start to feel this resentment growing over time. And this resentment is actually what's gonna start to like destroy and erode the relationship. And sometimes, sometimes too, will tell me that they're most angry with the people that they love the most. They're most frustrated with the people that they love the most. And so sometimes they, they'll spend their best time with the people that quote unquote don't matter as much. You know, the people out there in the world that do appreciate your help, do appreciate your kindness and your warmth and your friendliness and all that. And then you can be the most frustrated with the people that are, you know, inside your own fort. And it's like out there you can be happy and joyful and upbeat and warm. And then you come home and you can be, you know, quiet and silent and cold and rigid. And, and you know, this can be very challenging for people to understand about themselves or about the people that they love. And part of this could be just overextension is you're just overextended. Like it's hard to say no, it's hard to have boundaries and it's hard to advocate for your own needs. And think about this, you have this disintegration line to eight. Eight, the sin is lust. In other words, I'm gonna take what I need at other people's expense. And it's kind of like that, that eight sort of in a sense warns you that hey two, you have to be more assertive, you have to advocate for your own needs or you're gonna end up looking like an eight eventually, like demanding maybe, demanding your needs. And then, okay, next, another way that repression shows up for twos is emotional overload. 
Repressing your own emotions can lead to emotional overload, where twos may suddenly find themselves overwhelmed by unacknowledged feelings. So I would just say the word hurt is probably the right word. Hurt, uh, maybe a sense of like despair or just like a, a new apathy for this relationship. Like I don't care anymore. I'm just done. I'm just done. I give and I give and I give and they don't appreciate and they don't care and they don't respond and they don't even seem like they want to connect. I'm just done and just sort of this giving up. You know, like I'm done being nice. I'm done being kind. I'm done caring about this person's happiness. I'm done, you know, emotional overload, resentment, bitterness. All of these things start to grow under the surface. And then finally, another way that repression shows up is manipulation. And unconsciously, I think it's interesting. I put this word unconsciously in there. Unconsciously twos might manipulate situations or relationships to make themselves more indispensable, expressing acknowledge, expressing acknowledgement of this behavior as it repressing, I wish I could read, repressing, acknowledging this behavior, like not seeing your own ways to manipulate situations or people because that conflicts, conf, conflicts with your, with your own self image of being unconditionally generous. You know, think about it like this. You might say, uh, don't worry about dinner, guys. I'll bring dinner. And in your mind, you're thinking, well, isn't that nice of me? Isn't that thoughtful of me? Isn't that kind of me to bring dinner? Why would they not appreciate this? But from their perspective, what they might be hearing is, I want to control what is going to be for dinner. I'm going to bring what is for dinner. And so I get to control what is for dinner and what time dinner shows up and arrives. And you may not, you may not feel it that way at all or see it that way. You might think they're crazy for thinking that that's never your intention, but other people may feel like you're manipulating the situation because now you're the one bringing dinner. And what are we supposed to do now? Again, other people, they might just see you as the one down and they're like, well, yeah, great. Tate, bring dinner. Now I don't have to worry about it. Right. And then what will happen? There might be some resentment build up in you because I got to do all the work and they just take, take, take. But other people who might see you as, oh yeah, you're the queen, you're the king, you know, you're the queen of hearts, you're the king of hearts, you get to be the one that decides. Notice, remember eights and fives? They kind of have this mindset of like, why do you get to decide what we're having for dinner? Why do you get to decide, you know, what we're going to eat and when we're going to eat and what time dinner is? Why do you get to control things? Look at you trying to feign this kindness and generosity but really what's going on behind the sur surface is you're just wanting to control the situation. You want to be the one that decides what's going to be for dinner. And this might blow your mind. This, 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 like, that is not at all what I'm meaning. That is not at all what I'm intending. But you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be. People are going to say things like that to you and you're going to be very hurt and very dis, uh, you know, disillusioned and frustrated thinking, why would they ever think that? I'm done. And there it is, right? I'm done. And the people that you love the most, sometimes you can find the most frustration with. Okay? Where, what you say, well, what, what should I do? Well, what if they said, oh yeah, you're going to bring dinner. You know why? Because you want to, you always have to be in charge. What if you just looked at them and said, well, maybe, maybe I should be in charge. Maybe I know more than you. You know, what if you just kind of respond back with a little bit of punchiness, a little bit of eight, you know, or a little bit of three? Well, you know, hey, you know, you should do better at making dinner. If you learned how to cook like I do, then maybe we'd let you do it. <laughs> and it's, you know, and that's probably not in your nature to do that. But just a little bit of punch, 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 a little bit of assertiveness, push that stuff back. I don't know. All right, so let's let's look on. Let's let's keep going. Challenges and growth for twos. For twos, growth involves recognizing and honoring their own needs and feelings. Look at that line to four, right? That's what that is. It's like going internal and valuing, you know, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What is your heart? Setting healthy boundaries. That's the eight, right? Setting healthy boundaries. That can be tough. You know, you might want to check out the book Boundaries by Cloud and Townsend. John Townsend, Henry Cloud, if you really want to punch in the face, look up the book, um, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker. Fantastic books on boundaries. That disease to please is going to 
be a hard one for you to get through, but so helpful. Okay, so boundaries can be a challenge for twos. It can be about can be a challenge for everybody, but certainly for twos. Realizing that their loved ones does not depend on their constant giving or sacrifice. It's noble. Okay, let's pause here. It's very noble. Once again, let me say it. It's very noble, loving, and kind for you to be willing to sacrifice your own needs to take care of others. It just makes other people sometimes feel weird. Okay? You know, think like washing feet, like in the Bible, right? They would wash feet. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And what was Peter's response? Don't wash my feet. Like, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel like, you know, like humbled. When you're around pride... I'm going to feel humbled, right? And it makes me feel humbled. It makes it makes me feel on the spot. It makes me feel uncomfortable always being the recipient of your kindness, your grace, your love. And then I feel like it's actually like hurting you, like you're getting exhausted. You're you're beginning to be resentful of all of this serving of me. Please stop. Please stop and just relate to me as equals. Why does it always have to be, you know, like this? Just take a moment for yourself. And so this this could make other people have challenges in in being in a relationship all right so what could you do all right one two three four five number one self-care is you know the school bus every once in a while has to go to the shop and get repaired so that it can go out and run its route you're a school bus you're out there running your route taking care of everybody picking everybody up delivering people where they need to go it's not a bad thing it's not selfish and that's such a key for you because i think the anathema or the curse for twos is they don't want to be selfish Think how bad it would feel if somebody said, oh my gosh, you're so selfish. You're just so focused on yourself. That's exactly what people tell fours, right? And a two, like, oh, that would be the worst thing for somebody to think I was selfish or self-centered or self, you know, um, referencing all the time. But a little bit of this would indicate that you're growing. A little bit of this, a little healthy bit of this a little bit of uh, advocating for yourself and being a little more selfish, a little more focused on yourself would actually be good for you. Um, it It would mean that you don't feel as obligated to take care of everybody else. And the only way you could get to that point is either, well, I would just say the healthy way to get to that point is recognizing that your worth and value isn't completely attached to how well you're taking care of everybody else. Okay, so self-care. It's not selfish. It's essential that you take some time and some moments for yourself. Number two, accepting help. Again, you're the helper, but notice how difficult it might be for you to accept other people helping you. Becoming more open to receiving help and receiving love. Remember, people are loving you in the way that feels right to them. Um, It may not feel right to you. It may not feel like love to you but trying to accept the way other people are loving you and care from others, acknowledging their relationships, these are a two-way street, okay? Relationships are a two-way street. Like, for example, if you have a five in your life, they're probably not going to be overly affectionate with you, but they're going to share love with you by sharing information with you. You know, they're going to tell you all about Star Wars. They're going to tell you all about Star Trek. They're going to tell you all about combustion engines. They're going to tell you all about, you know, whatever their topic is. And they may go on and on for 20 minutes, and you're thinking... Why are they telling me all this? Don't they don't why don't they show love by hugging me or holding my hand or touching me or whatever, you know, and just realize like every type sort of expresses love in their, you know, sometimes unusual ways. Healthy boundaries. Setting and respecting healthy boundaries uh, for yourselves and your relationships can be very helpful because it prevents overextension and then ultimately that resentment. By being able to just say, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you today. No, I'm sorry, thanks for asking, but I'm just, I'm wiped out, I'm just done, thank you. And I think as you get older, it'll be easier and easier for for you to say these kinds of things because it's just life has a way of teaching you the hard way. Acknowledging your own needs, becoming aware and expressing your own needs and desires and being more vulnerable and less guarded, less self-protective, more open to relationships, the open to the very thing that you want, that those deep, intimate connections. Um, acknowledging your own needs is a way to get there. And then self-worth, working toward basing your self-worth on your intrinsic value as a human being. Just because you're creating the image of God, you have value regardless of what you do for others or regardless of how beautiful you are or how you know wonderful you are. By confronting their tendency to repress their own needs and feelings, twos can find a more balanced and fulfilling way of relating to themselves and others. 
learning that genuine love and appreciation come from being authentic, line to four, do you hear that? And caring for oneself as well as others. All right, guys, fantastic stuff. Thanks for sticking with me through this uh, video. I hope it's been helpful and challenging to you. And I hope you don't walk away from this saying, oh my gosh, Tom is so hard on twos. The Enneagram is hard on all of us. It just is. It calls out our stuff. It makes us face things that we don't necessarily want to face. And it, if you're feeling that way, realize when I, when I talk to threes, they feel that way when I talk about three stuff. When I talk to sevens, they feel that way when I talk about seven stuff. It just does that to us. And I'm sure I don't get it all right, but you know, then again, I'm not a two. I'm trying to understand as best I can. So thank you guys for being patient with me. Appreciate you guys. Love you all. And uh, I'll see you next time. And as always, be present to life. Thanks.